um, in uh, via the Central Venus Access Service at Liverpool Hospital in conjunction uh, with uh, the School of Nursing and Midwifery at Western Sydney University. So uh, firstly, um, slide change. <laughs> um, so firstly, uh, before going into the study, it's probably a good idea to rehash what um, a central venous catheter is. And essentially, these are catheters that are inserted by the large veins of the upper arm, uh, the chest, uh, the neck or groin, and they can be between 15 centimetres to 20 centimetres in length. They can be single lumen or they can be multiple lumen. And what makes a catheter a central venous access device is essentially that when that catheter is inserted and when it terminates uh, in the major vessels near the heart, so either just above or just below, it is termed to be a central venous catheter. Now, the reason why we need central venous catheters are multifaceted, but the primary reason is for dilution of that medication. So we're talking about medications that are typically um, given, if, if they were given through the peripheral vessels, they would cause significant irritation, inflammation, or as we like to uh, discuss with patients and, and educate, that these types of medications can effectively burn the vein. And we're talking about drugs such as chemotherapy, uh, strong antibiotics, as well as parenteral nutrition. And if you look at the flow rates on the bottom right hand side of your screen, you will see that as we advance towards the heart and as the vessels get bigger, the flow rate increases. And in fact, just before the heart, uh, the flow rate is up to two litres a minute. So as that medication uh, comes out of that central venous catheter, it is going to get mixed a lot better and reduce the risk of any inflammation of that blood vessel wall. Of course, the way we place these devices, um, they can stay in place for many days, many months, or even years if required. Slide change. Um, now, central lines uh, or the placement of central lines are not without risk. Um, and one of uh, the important issues around uh, central venous access is catheter tip position. Now, if we place a catheter and it is too short, we haven't placed it in uh, far enough, it can cause clotting of the major blood vessels. It can cause the catheter to malfunction. Or in fact, depending on how the catheter is inserted, particularly if it co it's coming from the left-hand side, it can cause vessel wall perforation. If, on the other hand, the catheter is too long, it can cause heart rhythm disturbances, it can cause um, heart wall perforation, as well as valve uh, dysfunction. And that's why um, uh, typically when we place these devices, uh, we require a chest X-ray to review the catheter position prior to its use. Um, now, the standard, uh, the standard practice of, uh, or the gold standard has been in the past uh, to take a chest X-ray after uh, the catheter has been inserted, as we've just um, elaborated. Now, this is so that we can visualise the catheter position and the pathway, as well as to be able to review the lung fields after we have placed a central venous catheter in the event that we have accidentally caused a pneumothorax or accidentally punctured the lung. The issue uh, with um, uh, chest X-rays is of course that they occur after we have uh, placed the catheter. And sometimes the image quality can be variable, which can also affect the interpretation of that X-ray film. We can sometimes, depending on the workload of the radiology department, be waiting uh, for some time before we can get that X-ray, which means we cannot actually use that catheter uh, to start treatment. And once we do get that chest X-ray and we do review it, and there's just some examples on the uh, top right-hand screen, um, if the catheter is malpositioned, we then need to reposition the catheter into an appropriate position. The problem with that, of course, is that we then need to disturb a perfectly sterile dressing. We need to take that off. We then need to physically manipulate that catheter to try and get it into position. And whilst we're doing that, we are again delaying any uh, vital treatment. So are there any alternatives to chest X-ray? There are a couple. Um, fluoroscopic guidance is probably one of the most common um, and these are dedicated uh, uh, suites such as uh, the operating theatres or interventional radiology where they utilise a continuous x-ray beam to project the, the, uh, the image onto a screen and what this does is it allows real-time view of the catheter and the wire being advanced into the vascular system. Sometimes they may use a little bit of iodine-based medication to help highlight the, the uh, blood vessel pathway 
But the limitation with these, with these suites is that they are highly sought after, they do require multiple personnel to utilise and they are expensive to set up and run. There is other um, alternatives. One is using ultrasound or transthoracic thoracic echo where we can ultrasound the heart and the major blood vessels. Um, and this can be done either bedside or as a mobile procedure. Um, but again, there are inherent limitations uh, in using that specifically it is uh, the operators need to have that training to be able to utilise that ultrasound machine. Now, the other alternative is intracavitary ECG. And the way that this uh, technique works is that we connect the catheter or bridge the catheter via a sterile adapter to an ECG readout device. We pre-fill the catheter with saline as saline is um, um, then transmits the signal uh, from the catheter to that ECG machine. And essentially the way it works is as the, the tip of the catheter becomes a dynamic ECG electrode. And as the catheter heads uh, through the vascular system, heading towards the heart, we start to pick up the nodal tissue of uh, the atrium, specifically the SA node, which is denotes the P wave. And as we head towards the atrium, we start to pick up uh, the P wave. The P wave starts to increase in amplitude. Once we have P wave max, we know that we are in optimal position for that catheter. So we can then uh, release the catheter for use. We do not need to worry about getting any type of uh, X-ray confirmation. Now, there are also um, limitations to this type of um, uh, technique. Uh, it can, um, uh, you know, patients that have a dedicated pace rhythm, we, it is difficult to use, as well as if they are in um, uh, rhythms such as atrial fibrillation. Uh, however, uh, it does provide real-time navigation. And the beauty of, I guess, of uh, intracavitary ECG is that you do not require any uh, specific medication um, uh, equipment. It provides real-time navigation, requires no radiation or iodine-based medication, and can be used in any hospital anywhere around the world. And this is just an example of uh, a colleague in Greece who uses intracavitary ECG. This is a pre-filled syringe and needle. The, the ECG is bridged purely by a sterile uh, forcept. Oh, if you just go back, sorry, and just play the video. Now, as you can see, as, um, as he's filling the, uh, the, um, the, the syringe and the catheter with saline, you can see the P wave starting to increase in amplitude. And once you have uh, P max or, or increased P wave amplitude, the catheter is in the right position and we don't need to worry about any X-ray confirmation. And so we can use simple technology. We don't need any, any fancy machines to be able to undertake this process. Now, when we first started looking um, at EC, intracavitary ECG, uh, our first question was, well, what's the evidence around its effectiveness in central venous cannulation? And we looked at, and when we started to look at the literature, we found there was a lot of observational studies and some randomised control trials. So in 2015, we undertook our own, random, uh, our own um, systematic review and meta-analysis of the randomised trials, and we found indeed that there was um, a favourable approach with um, intracavitary ECG. But one of the things we also found was that a lot of these studies were based around specific cohorts, such as those with cancer or, or neonates, and they, they tended to um, look at specific devices such as PICs. And there were very few studies looking at the cost effectiveness of the use of intracavitary ECG. So we surmised that uh, there were no uh, studies that had assessed the effectiveness of intracavitary ECG across a broad hospital population using numerous types of devices and assessing the cost benefit of that. And so the study, so uh, we decided in 2015, 2016 to undertake our own randomised control trial uh, with the aim to assess the clinical and cost effectiveness of this type of technology across a broad hospital population using multiple devices. The hypothesis was that by using intracavitary ECG, it would be more, more superior or more accurate than current practice. It would provide shorter procedure times, uh, less catheter malposition and improved efficiency and costs. So we undertook an open label randomized control trial looking at intracavitary ECG versus the traditional insertion of central venous catheters. 
So the sample size was calculated based on our own uh, malposition rate to be 344 catheters. So we allocated 172 into the traditional insertion group and 172 into the intracavitary ECG group. Both investigators and patients were blinded until allocation. And what that means is that we, uh, we, we took informed consent of the patient, neither the investigator or the patient were aware of what allocation the patient was going to be in until the, the computer gave us the uh, allocation group. Uh, because we were assessing uh, catheter position, we in fact took a chest x-ray in both groups so we could compare that catheter position. So the primary outcome for this study was to compare the rate of catheters that did not require any more repositioning after insertion and after review of that initial x-ray. And then our secondary outcomes were to compare the procedural cost and procedural time. So how did we go? Well, after analysis of the data, we found that in the ECG group, nearly all catheters placed with intracavitary ECG did not require any manipulation and could be used almost immediately. Compared to one in five catheters in the traditional group requiring the sterile dressing to be removed and the catheter to be remanipulated into position. We also looked at the number of manipulations during the procedure. And what we found was that we were more likely to uh, manipulate the catheter in the ECG group compared to the traditional group. And of course that makes sense because we were using real-time navigation, we were able to position the catheter appropriately whilst we were still sterile undertaking the procedure. We also had the opportunity then to uh, assess uh, procedure time. So we had an independent observer who had a stopwatch um, and clicked when we started the procedure and when we finished. So actual procedure time was from when we, we pierced the skin with the needle and when we applied the sterile dressing. The, the median time was 10 minutes in the traditional group and slightly longer in the uh, ECG group because of the fact that we had to do some manipulation. However, when we took into consideration the number of x-rays, number of extra manipulations um, and uh, waiting times for x-ray, we found that in fact, using intracavitary ECG reduced the procedure time by nearly two thirds. So we also had an opportunity because we were doing a randomized control trial, uh, we uh, employed the services of a qualified health economist. And we actually costed the procedure uh, between traditional insertion and, and intracavitary ECG. And overall, what we found was that utilising intracavitary ECG provided a cost saving to the organisation of $62 per procedure. Now, based on current central line service activity, this would equate to approximately $90,000 a year savings. Now, there were also some unexpected benefits uh, when utilising intracavitary ECG. During the first wave of the pandemic, we utilised a dedicated ICU to isolate patients who were, uh, uh, who were suspected or confirmed COVID-19 uh, patients. And many of these patients, when they became critically ill, required a central line for life-saving medication. Now, there was a real concern at the time around um, healthcare worker uh, uh, safety and infection rates among healthcare workers. And so any type of uh, safety strategy that could be utilised was, was certainly employed during the time. What we found was that utilising intracavitary ECG uh, for patients that required central venous access, in fact, reduced the time that clinicians spent in close proximity with infectious patients because the procedure time was less. And we also reduced the reliance on the number of allied health staff having to come into an infectious unit, such as radiology staff and orderlies. And if you think about the pandemic at the moment, this simple technique can be adopted in any ICU anywhere in the world. Now, probably the, the, the biggest thing that as a, as a service we're excited about is the fact that intracavitary ECG is not limited to acute and intermediate devices. It can of course also be used for chronic devices, um, such as long-term cuff dialysis catheters, Hickman catheters and implanted ports. And in fact, we, the central line service at Liverpool Hospital was the, were the first clinicians, whether medical or nursing, to utilise this type of technology to place um, uh, chronic catheters in Australia and one of the first in the world. 
Um, historically, these types of catheters are placed in interventional radiology or the operating suite. They are high demand areas with competing workloads. And what we found was by using this type of technology, we were able to free up some of the workload of these departments so they could then undertake more urgent cases. Importantly, what we found as well was that we were able to reduce the need for patients who were unable to be seen locally by our own departments and were going to hospitals outside of district to have chronic devices placed such as implanted ports, we were able to um, uh, have these patients have their, their procedures done locally and, they didn't, and reduce the burden of uh, families and patients having to go out of area to have these procedures undertaken. Now, because we were undertaking these procedures um, outside of those traditional suites, um, the question then beckons, well, you know, what are the outcomes? And well, this is an excerpt of a paper we're currently writing, looking at the outcomes of chronic catheter insertion uh, at the bedside. And what we found was when we reviewed the data th that um, over that study period, we had virtually no procedural complications. We had, when we followed all those catheters up, we had no central line associated bacteremias related to insertion. And when we followed them up and we looked at why these devices were being uh, removed, the overwhelming majority were being removed because they weren't required anymore or were in fact still in situ. Um, we also took the opportunity, of course, because we had the services of a, um, a health economist to actually cost the difference between bedside intracavitary ECG placement of chronic uh, catheters versus the utilisation of specific suites such as interventional radiology and operating theatres. And what we found was, depending on whether sedation was used or not, that the cost benefit of using an intracavitary ECG model was up to $600 per patient. As such, there are significant um, organisational benefits by utilising intracavitary ECG not only for acute catheters, but also for chronic devices as well. One caveat um, to this research translation is unfortunately we are unable at the moment to be placing uh, implanted ports, but we remain optimistic that our scope of practice will be once again reinstated and we can again provide that um, superior patient experience. So in conclusion, um, uh, we found that intracavitary ECG to be superior uh, to the traditional method of uh, central line placement. Uh, it provides real-time navigation, uh, saves time, saves money. It has the opportunity to free up critical uh, space in those high demand areas such as interventional radiology and operating theatres. And importantly for us, we can place these devices and have no radiation or any contrast being used. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Evan. Um, and look, it was remiss of me not to um, actually read through your bio right at the beginning, um, because I'm incredibly proud to actually be um, the Don of Southwestern Sydney where you undertake this work. And this is world leading um, research. So I can't emphasize enough how um, proud myself um, the nursing executive and I know um, the CE are all very much appreciative of the work that you actually undertake here in our district and putting um, not just southwestern Sydney, but for me, importantly, nursing on the map. So um, Evan is a senior lecturer with the School of Nursing and Midwifery at Western Sydney University, as well as being obviously a CNC um, in the intensive care unit at the Liverpool Hospital, where, um, as you can see through his research, he coordinates the central venous access service, which, as you can again see from the research, is internationally known for not only the research, um, but its innovation um, in um, procedures. Um, Evan is also involved in both clinical education, both for nursing and medical, um, at both the undergraduate and the postgraduate level, um, and is a conjoint um, lecturer with the um, Faculty of Medicine at the University of New South Wales. Evan is also an adjoint associate professor with the Avatar Group based at, in the Menzies Health Institute and Griffiths University in Queensland. So please join me again in thanking and congratulating Evan Alexandra and his marvellous team on the work that they've produced.
So from one of our locally homegrown um, researchers to another internationally um, renowned um, researcher, um, Matthew Ostroff. Matthew is an advanced practice nurse working in vac vascular access coordinator and a lead clinician for the award-winning um, hybrid ultrasound guided bedside vac vascular access program at St. Joseph's Health, specialising in patient populations spanning from neonate to adults. After earning the Outstanding Graduate Award from the Drexel University in Adult Gerontology Acute Care Nurse Practitioner, Matthew advanced his scope of practice under Dr. Mark Connolly, the Chairman of Surgery. Matthew has had the privilege of sharing his vision of a multidisciplinary vascular access service, speaking throughout the US and Canada, Latin America and Europe with the emphasis on critical thinking with complicated cases as evidenced by his work and publications on the use of the femoral vein in the mid thigh and alternate exit site locations achieved through subcutaneous tunneling. Matthew was the proud recipient of the 2020 Herbest Award for Excellence in Vascular Access in recognition of outstanding contributions to the art and science of vascular access. I'm very pleased that Matthew could join us today um, and be part of our Health Beyond Research and Innovation Showcase and our international guest. Please join me in welcoming Matthew Astor. Um, can you see my screen? Yep. Yes. Okay, great. Thank you so much for that introduction and for this invitation. Um, for those of you uh, that are not familiar with Dr. Alexandro, he did about in 2014, a uh, peripheral 1 million global campaign where countries all over the world participated in his study. And that's really where I met Dr. Alexandro. And it's such an honor to be a part of the Health Beyond Research and Innovation uh, Showcase. Uh, when Dr. Alexander reached out to me, I realized that I had finally made it to where I wanted to be, being able to collaborate with experts around the globe on the specialty of vascular access. We happen to be a part of one of the fastest growing and developing specialties with our patient population continuing to challenge us. But as Dr. Pitarudi says, the person probably in the example of the video in the previous presentation, he says, you know that when you are familiar with ultrasound, and with tunneling, you can solve 99% of the difficult situations. It's a huge responsibility for me to represent my country's experience with the COVID-19 pandemic, as every clinician around the globe has contributed to this crisis equally. So what I'd like to do today is to reflect on where we started at Ground Zero and take you through the initial wave, what we learned, and how we are working through the aftermath. I remember putting on the equipment for the first time. The media has covered a lot of information about infection prevention with the COVID virus in the hospitals. We began hanging the drips outside of the room and running the tubing through the glass to the beds. Okay, everybody, uh, I'm back. It's Matt. Um, you know, this is all evolving as we're taking care of patients. Our entire ICU was full of COVID positive patients. I brought my services down to the ER, line after line after line. Hey everybody, a couple pieces of advice that I'm noticing uh, that we're running low on supplies. We went through everything we had. I went through 10 to 15 kits a day. We knew our COVID positive patients by the color of their blood. It was almost black. I posted this to my website and it got viewed 1.34 million times around the world. To all the fire and EMS, you have no idea what it meant when you would come driving by our hospitals and show us support. 
Italy came out with the first vascular recommendations for these patients. I stayed up five nights straight to put together a webinar on vascular access in the COVID patient to hopefully help clinicians around the country. We began communicating through glass. Hey everybody, uh, just giving you an update again. This stuff is just uh, as we're figuring it out here at my hospital. Uh, the femoral dialysis catheters are clotting. They're not flowing well. Um, we're putting all the dialysis catheters into the jugular vein. We had patients in all different positions challenging us to get these devices in. We were out of supplies. We had industry bringing us whatever they had in their warehouses. The amount of death and suffering and isolation that we observed was getting to be too much. We had what you might call our light of hope, and that was Dr. Pruden. Every day we would walk by his window, holding up signs, trying to keep him going, because we knew if he kept going, we could keep going. And then he was finally discharged. We were called from patient to patient to patient. It couldn't even keep track on a piece of paper anymore. This was one shift on my arm, 17 central lines. Fast forward two months. My son's having a bad asthma attack in the hotel. His albuterol is not working. So I take him to the ER to get a nebulizer and we find a fever. Fevers don't go with asthma. And I looked at the doctor and we both knew. My son was COVID positive. He's doing fine, but that was probably one of the scariest moments. I hold my head down out of respect for all of the victims of COVID-19, out of respect to all of the essential workers, and out of gratitude to the families forced to stay at home and protect their families. This is a list of the amount of deaths worldwide as of April 4th, 2021. Um, today, my objectives are to provide an overview of vascular access recommendations and practices from admission to long-term care of the COVID-19 patient. Um, Scopitulo, Biascosi, and Pitarudi published on smart decisions for maximal safety in early 2020, and Violarti et al followed this with a CRT research group on vascular access, providing a vascular access flow chart for the vascular access patients with COVID-19. The key focus on this was to guarantee operator safety, ensure effectiveness of the maneuver, and to reduce the risk of complications. Fox and Duggar, as you'll see on the top right, uh, speak of the multiple applications of point of care ultrasound and COVID-19 in the Cleveland Clinic Journal of Medicine, specifically indicating the recommendation of mandatory ultrasound guidance for vascular access procedures. Ultrasound truly proved to be the universal tool for insertion, navigation, and tip confirmation in this emergent, rapid, and unpredictable environment. The COVID-19 patients present with a fluid deficit from fever, diarrhea, shortness of breath, and inadequate nutrition resulting in poor peripheral vasculature. And due to the fact that many of the patients will need their fluid status and nutritional status replenished, with the PO route usually blocked by a mask or an endotracheal tube, the need for central access for TPN should always remain in the clinician's uh, device decision. So we were no longer looking at the needs of the patient today, but we were looking at the trajectory of the disease process and where the patient would likely end up. And this led us to preserve routes for future needs such as dialysis. The clinician's most crucial role is minimizing exposure, which entails placing the proper device the first time, one that can dwell for an extended period, one that will provide blood draws, and one that can facilitate emergent needs. Minimizing exposure entails the proper PPE and performing the rapid vascular assessments for the intended device placement through the RAPIVA, RAFIVA, and RACIVA protocols, which are the rapid assessment for peripheral, the rapid assessment for central, and the rapid assessment of the femoral vein prior to cannulation. Having a clinician outside the door to hand you the appropriate pre-assembled kit when you are ready and completing the task with proper securement. 
Patients that can remain on a nasal cannula, a venti mask or CPAP, that were not in severe respiratory distress, we were able to treat with a long peripheral or midline catheter to the forearm or upper arm. You'll see here, this is an extreme case, uh, where these patient did not require central access, but due to the swelling in the upper extremities, there was no other option. So we placed a soft uh, eight centimeter catheter to the right external jugular vein in these patients. However, the potential to decompensate uh, is always present and should be prepared for early. Any patient that was in significant distress should have the central line placed as soon as it is safe. This can be done immediately if the patient is calm enough for line placement. Or in our hospital, I would place the ultrasound guided IV to perform sedation while anesthesia would intubate. And then immediately following the intubation, uh, we would place the central line. Patients should not require access in the prone position. This indicates a lack of preparedness because the patient had to be intubated at some time and an extra three minutes to place the central line is completely realistic. Central line placement uh, can be in the form of an IO, could be a PIC line, a peripherally inserted central catheter, a traditional central catheter, or a femorally inserted central catheter. And these can all be confirmed, as you just heard in the previous presentation, through intercavitory ECG or uh, bubble test. Ultrasound of the pleural space to rule out a pneumothorax was very important because COVID patients can develop a pneumothorax at any time. So sometimes you would place the central line prior to their initial chest x-ray, and then you would be confused whether the pneumothorax was from the lung rupture or from the procedure itself. Here are two examples from the superior vena cava approach uh, of ECG navigation and from the inferior. Honey. Yeah? Okay, so what we had here was a tunnel jugular. Um, we were unable to thread down uh, uh, smoothly uh, and then unable to pass a wire and kind of milk it in. So what I did was I went in down to the uh, tunneled site and uh, snared up the pick line, pulled it back out, brought the tunnel all the way through and then wired it, put it back down and this is what you can see on our VPS now. Um, so we'll close the tunnel up and my, uh, my sweetheart has her, has her line. And then an example from the Obviously femoral approach. So picks and peripherals were out because we're going for TPN. Medial here with the probe. We'll find the uh, femoral artery, as you can see, by a beating femoral vein. So we ended up doing the, the femoral vein. We put a 50 centimeter catheter up. Uh, we use ECG navigation. You can see the P waves uh, up there, almost as tall as the R wave. Smirka published on uh, personal protective gear and placing these central accesses. Um, and what he was able to demonstrate was that rescuers in full protective gear achieved IO access 100% of the time and were able to achieve a peripheral 89.9% of the time. So in that emergent uh, need, uh, go for the IO and then following that, use it as a bridge to place your traditional central line. Um, due to the natural progression of the critically ill to renal failure, consideration to preserve the right jugular vein should always be made. In the patient to the right, the picture that you see right there, uh, you'll notice a typical critical care patient that was requiring a triple lumen access as well as a dialysis catheter who had a left-sided pacemaker. This patient was too edematous for femoral access and dialysis catheters were not performing well in the femoral region due to the high incidence of thrombosis, leading my practice to start doing a double puncture where we would place the dialysis catheter to the right jugular vein and the triple lumen to the right axillary vein. Again, these were acute renal failure, not chronic renal failure of patients where we would avoid using the subclavian route. Um, in the US, uh, we have a very large chronically ill special needs population. Uh, this patient had a left-sided axillary TLC and required a dialysis catheter, but was contracted such that the right jugular was not an option and the right axillary vein was very poor caliber. So I placed a tunneled femoral triple lumen catheter to the right femoral vein and then transferred all the drips from the left axillary triple lumen to the leg line. And then you'll see the confirmatory uh, radiograph here showing the femoral line all the way up by the right atrium. 
then we were not able to go into the left jugular. So what we did was wire exchange the triple lumen axillary that was already there for a dialysis catheter. Um, and we were able then to thread that due to this patient's severe contractures and difficult uh, vascular anatomy. Um, this patient here was a great example of a patient with every device that you can imagine. Um, this patient had a left tibial IO catheter, a failed right femoral CVC access, a left upper extremity 20 and 22 gauge to the wrist and the hand, a right jugular acute dialysis catheter that was not placed by my team because it's a very high stick, a right axillary triple lumen catheter, a right axillary arterial catheter due to thrombosed radial arteries, and it was too obese for femoral arterial access. So we just had challenge after challenge with these patients. Um, the prone position became one of the biggest challenges of COVID-19. Um, as you can see, the IJ dressing, the internal jugular line dressing is being pulled from the neck in this position. This is when subcutaneous securement is highly recommended to prevent potential lethal outcomes of dislodgement and, of course, re-exposure to the clinician to go in and replace the line. These patients, again, would not be supine for 16 hours. COVID presented predominantly in the obese population in the United States, and prone position occluded the jugular, axillary, and subclavian approaches. So prone pick placement could be performed, but again, their upper extremities were severely uh, swollen. So I published on using the mid-thigh femoral vein from the prone position. Uh, I was able to access this, and here's a example. So we have a COVID-19 patient prone, will be prone for 16 hours. Obese, unable to access jugular or subclavian. Means renal dialysis, AV fistula. We're going to go into the mid thigh uh, from the prone position and thread a six French 55 centimeter catheter uh, up to the right atrium. Okay, again, this is COVID 19 uh, dialysis patient prone. They were very, very deep. We found we're able to access the femoral vein in the mid thigh, six French triple lumen 55 centimeter catheter up to the inferior vena cava, giving triple lumen access on prone patients. Adams and Muzua published on accessing the popliteal vein for dialysis catheter placement in a critically ill patient that was COVID-19 positive in surgery. Um, in cases where central line access was required to be replaced uh, with continued prone treatment, I began tunneling from the jugular vein to the axillary or the axillary vein so to the outer arm. Uh, we have a patient here, uh, a morbidly obese patient here, who is, uh, has a left uh, trialysis catheter and presently as the physicians did a high puncture left jugular uh, triple. Um, but she's going to be long term, but she's continuing to be prone. So we're going to uh, puncture the jugular tunnel out uh, to the arm to protect it uh, during the proning. So what we're going to do is um, the physicians did a high puncture jugular triple yes. lumen. Uh, we're going to access a low uh, puncture jugular vein here. So we take back the dressing. Uh, and then because she's still being prone, we tunnel back down to the arm. Yeah? Yeah. Um, so we've draped our uh, tunnel area with towels. Um, so I'm measuring the tunnel here, and I'm going to see if perhaps I can do this in a single tunnel because her skin bunches up and is able to be pressed, um, which will prevent an extra puncture site for infection. Wow. Okay, so if you come back here, 
we were able to kind of scrunch up the arm and make this a single tunnel. When we released this, the reason we have the catheter attached already is because when we release this, the tunnel is going to disappear. See this into the tissue. The catheter through here, and we have the. I'm just going to bring you closer to the end of the video uh, in the interest of time. We confirmed this with ECG, but due to all of her complications, she was getting serial chest x-rays. And then you'll see we have a jugular tunnel to the outer arm, so she can be proned without uh, risk of removal of the catheter. Um, uh, arterial lines are uh, recommended in the ICU for anyone that was getting frequent ABGs and frequent blood draws. Uh, it also prevented the nurses from having to stick the patients over and over. In our long-term uh, patients with no improvement, but still required to be on pressors and multiple medications, uh, we would tunnel to the chest for long-term triple lumen access. Finally, in our long-term patients uh, who ended up being palliative care, who were swollen and, and vasculature exhausted, um, we introduced the concept of the femoral midline catheter. Essentially, it was just a stable vein that was to be used for days, literally two to three, four days. Um, so the complication of thrombosis was not of concern. It was to get continuous morphine drip. Um, and it proved to be a really successful, uninterrupted, uh, simple, non-invasive procedure for these patients. Um, while rare, with the COVID vaccines, they had side effects. Um, we've had patients with um, thrombocytopenia. This patient had a platelet count of one. Uh, double lumen pick was placed to the upper arm. Uh, the literature has us using low molecular weight heparin due to the clotting of the COVID-19 patients, um, but it's also important to be aware and monitor for heparin-induced thrombocytopenia. Um, Lingamani published on a 63-year-old male who, after being treated for lower extremity DVT, had a sudden platelet drop days 11 and day 12 of the hospitalization, so they switched the heparin to a gatraban. Finally, um, I was looked at the infections uh, of all of the catheters that we placed over that year. I placed 900 central lines uh, in COVID positive patients, and we had nine infections. Seven of them were with Candida. And what we found was that Giardo published on a retrospective study of seven hospitals in Lombardy from February 21st to May 31st of last year and found the main culprit to be Candida. So um, this just emphasize the need for worldwide collaboration and sharing of data to realize that we're all facing the same obstacles, but more importantly, how we can all come up with the solutions to these obstacles so that patients around the world can benefit. Lastly, due to the chronic uh, uh, radiographs that we were shooting every day for their lungs, we noticed that the catheters migrated up and down and all around. So we had to do a lot of repositioning with uh, power flushing. Uh, and this is just my last slide. I see I'm out of time. Just the three important Important things were airway with anesthesia, ventilator from respiratory, central access from the vascular specialist. And um, I just play this last video of what one day is usually like for us. Um, this tragic pandemic provided the unfortunate opportunity to demonstrate the vascular access specialist expertise as vascular teams across the world perform the most critical procedures with grace and bravery. I wanna thank you all for the invitation to share my work. And I wanna leave you knowing that the leaders in vascular access from all countries are collaborating with each other. And together we will continue to develop innovations and all patients will eventually obtain vascular access. Thank you so much for this invitation and I really appreciate your time. Thank you so much for that presentation, Matt. Um, firstly, my heart goes out to you and your family having um, lived through what you've lived through in the last 12 months in the US. Um, and a big thank you to the work that you've undertaken for all of those patients. 900 um, central lines inserted in 12 months is amazing. Um, so again, thank you. Personally, how's your son? My son is good. And that's 900 just me. Uh, all the other physicians did too. We went 
there were thousands and thousands in our hospital. It was, it was, it was tough, but Evan, Dr. Pitarudi, we all communicated around the world. And it was amazing because Italy started with the first wave. And then I was able to learn from Italy. And I remember when Evan contacted me and said, Hey, Matt, you know, COVID is now here in Australia. And we were able to help each other with what we learned. And it, it's just amazing to have an international community that can communicate the way we can, even with this conference like we have today. No, that's fantastic. And I'm so pleased that um, your son's doing well now. Um, I know Evan's got a couple of questions for you, and we're going to open it up to those who are online um, to also ask questions. So for everyone online, if you've got any questions, please um, put them in the chat and we'll try and get them answered for you. But I'm going to start off with um, Evan because I know he's got a couple of questions. Matt, with, the, with patients that you found had difficult access, how many what was the proportion of patients that you would start off with intraosseous? Um, so I didn't use intraosseous um, only because teams like yours and, and myself are so good with ultrasound that we know where to find emergent veins. And for the audience that's listening, if I can leave you with one, one fact, it's just that there's always a brachial vein in the antecubital region in 99% of patients. It's a go-to site that you can get a 20 gauge in. And once you get access, then you can bridge to more. You can sedate through that and then do your more complicated access. So we were able to avoid that. But in the emergency room, uh, Evan, uh, Dr. Alexander, they, uh, they use the IO. Yeah, excellent. And did you, did you ever have the opportunity to use that, um, that uh, intraosseous device to assist in, um, uh, particularly if it was in the humeral head, to stabilize the auxiliary vein to then being able to cannulate the auxiliary or subclavian vein? Uh, so in our hospital, unfortunately, they primarily go to the tibia. Um, even though I agree with you, uh, humeral is, is a higher flow, more rapid rate. Um, so we didn't experience that, um, but we did experience the benefits of the ECG navigation in these critical uh, patients where you didn't have the time to have a malposition. Uh, so it worked fantastically. I, I will uh, say that we used it on left-sided insertions. Right-sided jugular insertion, it, it, once you put your introducer in, it's a straight shot down to the heart and we primarily go with 15 to 16 centimeters. So we never had a malposition on our right side, uh, even with radiograph, but always from the left, we always use ECG navigation because there's a multitude of you know, locations it can end up. Thanks, Matt. We've got a question here for, um, for Evan. So Evan, um, how did you manage to obtain consent from all your ICU patients? Did you have to rely on um, the relatives to provide consent, or did you only um, recruit patients who were not so ill that they could provide their own consent? Uh, yes, yeah, so because this was like a point of care, uh, pragmatic, uh, randomised trial, uh, we only recruited patients that could provide their own um, uh, their own informed consent. And so, um, when you look at when you look at the flow diagram of how many patients were enrolled. Uh, versus how many were eligible, we in fact probably uh, only out of the ones that were eligible, it was only about 50% of patients were, were um, uh, appropriate for consent. So that, yes, that was an issue, not only for ICU patients, but patients that we bring to the ICU to have lines of ward patients, um, if they were confused, um, you know, they were from a um, non-English speaking background, could not provide informed consent, that were, were not eligible for the study. Terrific, thanks, Evan. Um, we've got a, a couple of questions that have come through here. Matt, another one for you from um, Kay Rolls online. Um, she says, thanks, Matt. Long catheters create difficulties in delivering high volumes. How difficult was this through this last 12 months um, with those 900 patients that you put various long catheters in and some very long catheters um, in, um, in providing the treatment that they required? So COVID uh, was obviously a respiratory illness. So fluid volume became a very important uh, uh, 
um, parameter that we were always balancing um, because these patients would go into renal failure. Um, so large volumes of, of fluid and, and blood, we didn't have a lot of trauma. So we didn't have any challenges uh, through using like a 55 centimeter catheter or a 30 centimeter catheter. Although of course, with the hemodialysis catheters, they were large bore um, and they would be put on continuous renal replacement therapy um, through those. So our triple lumens were always seven in French, which provided a pretty good uh, a flow rate. And, and let me just clarify, our pick lines were triple lumen as well, and they were six French. So they were 18 gauge in all the lumens, which provided pretty, pretty rapid flow. Thanks for that, Matt. Um, and that's, just to add, just I'm so sorry, just to add one more caveat. Um, remember, we're running tubing from outside of our room. So even if we had a short catheter, to get those flow rates, um, to get through those tubings, which we had to use micro like MRI tubing to, to reach those long distances, there was really not much rapid uh, anything with the COVID patients. So just let me understand this correctly, Matt. The actual IV fluids were outside the patient's room that you were yes. delivering to. Wow. That, way the that way the nurses could change and do everything without exposing themselves in the rooms, which was very dangerous because you couldn't monitor the site. Um, so yeah. I mean, you were running things out here and you had no idea what was happening in there. Wow, that's amazing. Um, Matt, there's a couple of questions because obviously um, we were very lucky here in Australia and did not um, suffer nearly the, um, the impact of COVID of what you've seen over in the US. Um, so we've got a couple of questions about, um, you know, the effect on the healthcare professionals. And if over this last 12 months, there's one piece of advice that you could provide um, healthcare professionals around their own wellbeing during things like a pandemic, what might that be? Um, it's, it's talking to your colleagues. Um, we would get through the day very well, uh, as uh, Dr. Alexander will explain to you. I mean, we go in and we do very high risk cases every day, all the time. Um, but what was difficult was, I'll tell you the most difficult was when I went into one of the rapid responses to put in the central line because they called me and one of my colleagues put her hand on my shoulder and she said, Matt, that's my dad. Um, it hit home with a lot of us and um, and that was that was hard. So I would say talking. Um, it's important to uh, talk about the experience you had that day, talk about what was hard, what was easy, laugh a little, um, because day after day of the death that these so you had medical surgical nurses that were becoming ICU nurses because our whole entire hospital became COVID on ventilators. So you had nurses that wanted to be nurses to make you feel better, to give you medicine when your blood pressure is high. And all of a the sudden they're seeing patients die every single day. So these people that were not critical care, not ER, were seeing a, a different world. And, and it was very hard. So speaking and debriefing after codes, like when you go in with a team, what worked, what didn't work? Did anesthesia get in the way? Did you get in the way of anesthesia? Was the ventilator not hooked up? We had instances where anesthesia would run in the room, but the line wouldn't be in to provide the sedation or they would sedate without respiratory there with the ventilator. Um, so coordination and, and we learned, at, you know, it's amazing that you started this talk about Florence Nightingale and the Crimean War. I can't believe in this day and age, Evan and I and all the other clinicians, we, we figured out how to work through a, a crisis, a pandemic in healthcare that no one had ever faced on this kind of scale in our generation. So um, talk. I think, um... Those who come after all of us will be learning about, you know, the work that you, you guys and your colleagues around the world have undertaken and the lessons that you've learned and the research that you've put into this about how to manage these patients moving forward. Um, we have got a couple more questions here um, and then we're going to have to wrap up. Um, so there's one here from Cathy Brennan, who's also um, one of our um, nurse practitioners um, across the district. And Kathy's asked, are femoral entry midline central catheter tips confirmed via x-ray? 
So we use ECG uh, and we use it the same way that Evan uh, presented. It's amazing. I remember the first uh, mid thigh I did and it was so simple that I said, you know, why don't we just put the wire through and see if it works? I mean, I, I mean, I didn't know it would work. And then all of a sudden I saw the same confirmatory signal. And um, so we confirm it with ECG uh, as well. I, I also use Doppler flow. Um, because a lot of times in, in Americans are kind of tall, so we don't get all the way to the right atrium. Uh, so the flow of the IVC, I monitor. And when I know I'm in the IVC, we've had very good outcomes with that. Terrific. Thanks, Matt. And I think this last question will really um, wrap up um, this session um, today for us. And we've got an anonymous attendee who's asked, where to from here? What other collaborations can we have? And the work that um, Evan and yourself, Matt, um, are undertaking, where to from here? What's next? I'm gonna let Evan go first. Um, I think there's, there's uh, uh, lots of opportunity. I mean, Matt and I are part of a, um, a large group of uh, vascular access experts around the world. We're all part of the, um, the World Congress on, on vascular access. And, um, you know, that in itself, when we meet and we, we talk, we talk over email, we, we have virtual meetings, um, we're able to foster ideas and foster research. Um, one example, for example, that, that I can give you is, um, as Matt's been talking about, is the femoral approach. Um, we, you know, I first started uh, looking at the femoral approach after seeing a presentation um, that Matt did in America a few years ago. And then we had a chat and then we brought that concept over and then we've started to fashion that, um, um, uh, that technique as well here in Australia. And again, we're, we're, you know, we're collaborating and we're, we're, you know, we're reviewing our data, we're publishing the evidence and hoping that others then will take on that evidence um, and utilise it. And certainly when it comes to the femoral uh, access, particularly in the ICU, when we first started uh, placing these mid-thigh picks or mid-thigh lines, um, a lot of the ICU medical staff were like, oh, don't be going in the femoral vein because of the potential risk of infection. But when we started to discuss with them the fact that, you know, the density of flora mid-thigh is almost equivalent to the upper arm and the way we're placing them, utilising what we call catheter vein ratio, smallish vein in a large in a large volume vessel, we started to get a change in the, in the way medical staff were thinking. And in fact, in our ICU, um, it is very common now that ICU consultants will come to us and ask us for a tunnel mid thigh life. So we've been using this, um, we've been using the research, we've been translating it. And I think there's a lot of areas in vascular access that, you know, moving forward. And I must say, the, you know, in the US, there's a huge, um, a, a huge body of evidence that is being produced. But I can also say hand on heart that Australia, through the Avatar Group um, at Griffith University, is one of the most world leading vascular access research groups. Terrific. Matt, yeah. would you like to add anything? Um, well, I'll, I'll put a period on that sentence for Evan. Um, he's absolutely right. Um, what's, what's kind of exciting about the group that Evan and I get to uh, converse with is we're doing what probably is going to be common maybe in five or 10 years for, for all programs at the bedside. I, I tunnel to patients' backs that are confused so they can't pull their lines out. For me, it's very simple. To uh, other physicians, it's like mind shattering, like, what are you doing? Um, but now, like Evan said, at my hospital, the doctors say, Matt, it's a, it's a back tunnel. Um, it's very common now. Um, and, and like Evan said, we're publishing on this. This, this was the main uh, problem or, or challenge of vascular was we were doing, but we weren't publishing enough. And now we're all starting to learn and, and publish with each other and with using uh, you know, PhDs like, like Dr. Alexandro to, to be our mentors, to help us learn how to publish. Um, and then what is going on in Australia with Avatar 
um, please believe me from the US, they're the highlight of all of our conferences. Um, you guys lead the world in research, uh, probably at level or second or first to Italy. Um, but what Dr. Um, Alexandra is doing right now with tunnel dialysis catheters at the bedside is probably the top of where we're going to go, I think, in vascular access. And just to tell you of how we work together, I had a meeting with um, Dr. Alexandra's team of how I can start to incorporate this. And then I put in a plan at my hospital. So really what we do is we share and say, hey, look, this is working, it's helping. He tries it, I, uh, we don't try, we, we, you know, we do it safely, but we're helping each other see things that when you work in a hospital and you only know what you know, but when you open your eyes and you see all these other people, if, if I could publish in a book, then this will be my last sentence, the emails that we get from all these experts and you saw the conversation, you would see magic happening. And that's what's happening in vascular access right now. Magic is happening and patients are benefiting from it. Thank you very much, Matt. So on behalf of Southwestern Sydney Logan Health District and the Ingham Institute, I wish to thank both Matthew Ostinoff and Dr. Al Evan Alexandro, who um, today have really shown us that um, the evidence is there for these nurse-led vascular access services to really grow and populate, not only for the best patient outcomes, but also because it makes economical sense for our health services moving forward. So please join me in thanking both of these two amazing gentlemen who have um, proven to us today that this is obviously the way forward for all of our vascular access services across the world. Thank you. Thanks, Matt. Thank you, you so much.